Hello everyone from Southern California. I'm A.G. Billig, published author and founder of Self-Publishing Mastery, and I welcome you to a new episode of the Self-Publishing Mastery Talks. Today's episode is all about writing the writing craft. We have a very special guest today. His name is Gerald Everett Jones. He's an award-winning author of Thriller and Mysteries. He's also a book shepherd and an author coach and the founder of the Get Published radio show. Did I miss anything, Gerald? Hello and welcome. Oh, that, there's only 30 years of my resume you've left out, but that's why oh, it's not particularly <laughs> interesting. Lovely to be with you again, uh, AG. It's great to have you here. Um, so uh, Gerald and I have, uh, you know, if we think, uh, three years or four years back, we have a history together already. Oh, I was, yes. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I th I, you were just off the boat or just yeah. off the plane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you taught me that, that, that idiom of the boat. Uh, well, I went to the uh, LA Festival of Books, and here it was, the uh, Independent Writers of Southern California booth, and Gerald was there. And um, we started a conversation, and then I found out about one of the one of their meetings and uh, I went there and I went there to, 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 to meet Gerald again because I thought, oh, this guy is so interesting. This guy, is, this guy knows so much. Uh, I need to, to connect with him and learn more about him. And that, then I started listening to the, listening to the podcast, the, um, to the Get Published radio show. I was a guest on your podcast and then I started reading his books. And uh, yeah, so we've been... Uh, We've been in touch for all these years, and he was also one of the, our uh, top guests on the Self-Publishing Mastery Summit two years ago, and I'm sure things will continue. Well, you know, as we, we introduced the show, we would say, here's your host, Gerald Everett Jones. He has the answers because he's made all the mistakes himself. <laughs> right. And right. in fact, you know, yes, I was involved with I was involved with the internet when it was blue screens. Uh, you know, I go, I, I had a extensive background in computer graphics back when, you know, it was, it took a computer the size of a room to make a business slide. And, and then I wrote a lot about uh, what was Harvard graphics that it became PowerPoint, whatever, but also more to the point, this whole phenomenon of self-publishing, we're living at the time, it's like living at the, during the invention of the printing press. I mean, this is really epic making. And it, it was interesting. I, I, I might allude a couple of times to having taken master classes with, you know, these online classes with uh, famous authors. And um, one that was really helpful was Dan Brown. I might talk mm -hmm. about that in a minute. Uh, because I didn't really expect to get anything new from him. <laughs> it, of course I did. But, you know, I also took James Patterson's master classes, you know, master mystery thrill, thriller writer. And it was interesting to me that he was talking about, okay, uh, you need an agent, how to get an agent, here's how to query an agent, uh, here's what publishers want. And I'm thinking, okay, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is the body of yours. Gosh, your I agent in 1974. I looked it up. Okay. <laughs> um, the chances of somebody actually querying uh, a, an agent in the fiction space and uh, getting a book deal, especially if it happens to be your first book, uh, is, I mean, with, with what, a million books being published every year and some huge portion of those mm -hmm. being self-published? The noise level is just astounding. And what I like to compare it to is the music business. And this was actually true when I was in computer graphics as well. The music business came first with online because its bandwidth is the narrowest. Okay, you could actually download a song back when it took five minutes to download a song. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what was the formula for success in the music business. Well, suddenly the labels had no more, they called them A&R men, okay, talent scouts. Mm -hmm. They just started watching clicks. You know, who's getting the most clicks? Well, you know, you get a million clicks. It's, hey, kid, uh, how'd you like to go on tour? Okay, the, the book, the um, 
record labels did not go away. They're still there. Okay, but they're only taking people who are on a level of we can we'll invest five million dollars in your next world tour. Okay, they're not they're not building careers. Careers are being built on YouTube and iTunes and just the same way that self-published authors are being are being are building their careers now. And an example that I like to use, I don't know if you have ever heard the the jazz orchestra. Uh, uh, Pink Martini. Yeah, sure. But I've Pink seen Martini them. Pink Martini yeah, yeah. has never been with a major record mm -hmm. label. They yeah. self-publish all their mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. They own their own label. And where did I hear them first? I heard them New Year's Eve at Disney Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow they got themselves booked into Disney yeah. Hall. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so they must be doing something right. And if you go on YouTube and you look at the world tours of Pink Martini, they're, they're you know, they're in Munich, they're, they're in Australia, they're in Japan, and they've got fans all over the world. Yeah. So, yeah, so sure. here's an interesting model of, um, you know, and I've, I've got my, you know, my recent mystery series here in the background, uh, Preacher Finds a Corpse and Preacher Fakes a Miracle. That's a double award winning book, right? Well, uh, Preacher Finds a Corpse, the first one, yes, one, uh three oh. won two awards and uh and then i won another one for literary fiction clifford spiral and uh and then i actually wore uh, won one in the business in the business book space that was all this year so it's funny because um our colleague gary young says yeah that's four and counting <laughs> <laughs> so because there's still there's still some that haven't announced so we'll see what happens but um but yes uh, uh i hadn't done I did one satire series um, years ago, uh, Rollo Hemphill Misadventures. And um, that was about a, like a young man failing upward. They were, they were kind of reverse romantic comedies, like how, how to fall out of love, like, <laughs> or something like that. So but, um, um, I want to say we are here today, uh, as you can already tell, I mean, Gerald knows a lot about self-publishing because he's also helping authors who are choosing this path um, and for sure we are going to have him back on the self-publishing mastery talks to discuss more self-publishing and what you can do to market your book and how you can get to that stage where uh, a, a big publisher will come to you and say hey I want to give you a contract and you will say no I don't want it because I'm already making that much money that <laughs> making you know, too much money yeah why would I share my you know why would I give you 50% of my royalties uh, but today we have a really special um, topic uh, for you. That's something that not, min uh, not many people talk about uh, because not many people are really aware and they don't know how to talk about it, I guess. And it's related to your uh, writing craft and it's related to how you can use your mind and particularly your subconscious mind to write the books you want to write. Because Gerald knows about it and because that's something he's using to write that book you see there his books that and that books get a word it's something i'm discovering uh -huh. and, and, and it's a process of discovery because i actually i wrote a blog post about this last week you know i wrote a lot of business books my 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 professional writing career was primarily business and technical books especially how to computer books mm -hmm. back when you actually needed books mm -hmm. you know when the help systems weren't so good and the inter user interfaces weren't so easy but um you know i would write for publishers and i would they would assign an editor and i would mm -hmm. have an outline and i would mm -hmm. have six bullet mm -hmm. points for every chapter and i had to turn in two chapters a week and if i did not hit every one of those bullet points i got my wrist slapped <laughs> okay <laughs> so i you know it's not that i don't know how to write to outlines but um one of the things i found about writing mysteries mystery thrillers and I'll, I'll, now I'll, I'll hark back to these, these uh, master classes with Dan Brown. I mean, one of the things about Dan Brown is he is noted as a guy who knows how to write page terms. And uh, yeah, I so had, I, having read quite a few of his novels, I thought, okay, it must have to do with, with threat. Okay, you know, we're always putting the, the hero in his girlfriend du jour 
uh, you know, under, you know, they're in a room that's too small. They're in, they're, the place is about to flood. Something's about to explode. And it turned out that that's not his formula. I mean, certainly that's how his, the, that's how he has paid off his formula at times, but his formula is this. And this opened a door for me. He said, what you want to do, keep people turning pages is you have to keep making promises. Mm, interesting. Probably that's, that's what uh, hooked me up on the, on the Da Vinci's code. I'm not a, I'm not a, Absolutely. I'm not a regular mystery and thriller uh, reader. Uh, so, but I, I, I heard a hype around that book and I said, I need to read it. So I read it in English and I was like this. It's you know, I couldn't curiosity. stop. It's I curiosity. Stop. And, and, the, and the way that it's different from writing to an outline, for example, is in a business book, if you introduce a new term, the absolute hard and fast rule is you must define it on first use. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the reader knows. And often in a scholarly book, you'll have an abstract at the top of the chapter that's going to tell you everything that happens in the chapter and, you know, how the chapter turns out, what, what the conclusion is. Here it is, a paragraph right at the top. And if you're studying for a test, just read all the abstracts of all the <laughs> chapters and you're going to be in good shape. Right. Well, in a mystery or in a thriller, you might introduce something that you introduce it in a way that it's a minor detail. Okay, Here, here's a half a dozen objects on the person's desk one of those is going to be significant. Well, I'm not going to tell you how significant it is when you first see it. I'm not even going to let you know, know that it's significant. The thing that I will say, though, about writing from the subconscious is, if as a writer I have allowed myself to just describe what there is on the desk, I don't know what's significant either. Okay. I don't I, – I, and, and there are any number of times that I've put in details where, yeah, I, well, uh, he's got red hair. Uh, and I don't know why I put it in. I don't know why I associated with that, with that character. And yet, three chapters later, another character is describing something that had happened to her. And he says, yeah, this deputy walked in, young guy. Uh, you know, all I remember is his uniform. And, and uh, Evan says, did he have red hair? Yeah. yeah. Well, that turns out to be, that's the one, that's the one, <laughs> the one guy in town, the one sheriff's deputy that Evan knows pretty well and he knows not to trust him. Okay. Well, suddenly we've got a, we've got a, we've got, we, we've, we're linked up. And I found my, my mind doing this to me over and over again, where, you know, I wanted to know where it was going. And if I didn't know where I was going, and then it ultimately paid off, it was, it was very pleasing to me. And I realized that, wow, you know, the reader should get a kick out of it too, because if I didn't see it coming, they Maybe would. they didn't either. Yeah. So on both of these books, I've had my, I have a, I always have about a dozen beta readers and they're usually writer colleagues and, and, you know, they tend to be, they're a pretty tough crowd mm -hmm. because, you know, they, they know yeah. the trade and uh, almost uniformly they've told me, well, you know, I really didn't know what was going until the last page. And I said, I didn't know what was going to happen until the last page. So that is one of the ways you do it. Uh, Gerald, I want to, I'd like to stop a little bit and explain what is this subconscious mind? Because maybe not everyone, I mean, I'm sure everyone heard sub subconscious mind. Everybody, everyone is familiar with these two words, but maybe we can explain Well, you know, what uh, that, is. that actually is a, a, a fairly technical explanation, I would say, because the distinction between subconscious and unconscious is something that you're going to find even clinicians disagreeing about. <laughs> okay, now for sure, uh, portions of your mind that are unconscious are making your heart beat. Okay, so it's pretty clear that, you know, you're not going to be able to get in there and tell your heart when to beat. So I think we can, I think we can put that definition aside. However, uh, the psychologist uh, uh, Carl Jung wrote extensively about what he called the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, by that he meant the 
collected wisdom of the entire human race uh, expressed, and again, back mm -hmm. to Dan Brown, expressed at times in, in primitive symbols, in, yeah. in, in um, uh, imagery, and in experiences that evoke uh, uh, our, uh, archetypal seminal emotions. So uh, there's a great deal of disagreement about whether that even exists, okay? Subconscious mind, though, is um, uh, the theory of the subconscious is that uh, it's a portion of your mind that really retains just about everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And your conscious mind is, is from moment to moment censoring yeah. the outputs from that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and only selecting the things that are useful at this particular time. Now, the, the psychologist Milton Erickson, who um, was noted to be a hypnotist, he was noted as a father of neuro-linguistic programming. But what a lot of people, I think, don't appreciate about him is that what he really believed in was the power of storytelling. And people who were patients, uh, clients, would come to him with issues. And he would sit in a darkened room with them, and he would simply, he'd listen to them a bit, mm -hmm. and then he'd tell them a story. And it would be only a few minutes long. And most of them could not see any connection between, you know, if, you know, if, if somebody gave you a, you know, some teacher said, well, let me give you a, an analogy. Let me give you an illustration. It really wouldn't take too much ima imagination for you to know why they picked that story. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in Erickson's case, there seemed to be no connection, whatever. And these people would walk out and they'd go, what a fake, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, why, why did I waste my money? And then two weeks later, they come back and somehow, somehow their symptoms had disappeared. Oh. Now, no one, even Erickson's fellow practitioners, could explain how he came up with these stories. It was intuitive. And there is a book called My Voice Will Go With You, which was written by his colleague, Sidney Rosen, which tries to, now Erickson's passed away, so you can't ask him, okay? But Rosen tried to explain um, why some of these stories worked. But the main thing about Erickson was he believed that the story became more powerful after you think you've forgotten it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, because yeah. then your conscious mind gets out of the way. Any mm -hmm. judgments that you're making and your subconscious just can work on you, work on you, work on you. Now, when I've talked uh, to writers groups about uh, historical fiction, and the idea that historical fiction is all about today. Well, of course, if it's written by people today and they think they know what was going on in the Gilded Age, well, they didn't really because they know about the internet and those people didn't. They had cell phones, those people didn't. And your mind is, is skewed certain ways in ways that you don't appreciate necessarily the way theirs weren't. You know, you're, there was a, uh, an era of horse-drawn carriages and gas lamps and and electricity was only a novelty and a few people had telephones. So, uh, but the thing about that is in terms of forgetting stories, you know, a lot of us have read Moby Dick. You know, we had mm -hmm. to read it as yeah. a, you know, that was part of our high school curriculum. Right. And if not Moby Dick, Great Expectations or Huckleberry Finn or one of those. Okay. Now, if I were to sit you down for any of those books and I would say, tell me the story. Uh, it would be hard. Well, there was a white whale, and there was, you know, the captain was trying to kill it, and there was yeah. this guy named Starbuck, and I think he had a chain of coffee stores. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't really know, you can't really say too much. But I would submit to you that Moby Dick is, ex is affecting you, if you read it, or if you even had a lesson on it, is affecting you in ways today that you'll never be able to express. And this is, this is true of what, what we would call the canon of Western literature, okay, mm -hmm. which includes Bible stories, Greek mythology, you know, every story we were ever told. And there is a branch of linguistics or actually literary analysis called semiotics. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Roland Barth and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Noam Chomsky is involved in that as well. And um, this was 
highlighted in Jeffrey Eugenides' novel, The Marriage Plot. And the, these were kids at Brown University who were studying semiotics. That was part of the plot. But semiotics basically held, at least according to Eugenides, that we would not really know love, romantic love, without unless we had read stories about it, unless we'd been taught through literature. And, you know, uh, I remember uh, going through the, um, the ruins of um, Ephesus in Turkey, which is, you know, was basically a Greek society once upon a time. Yes. And the tour guide said, you know, yes, uh, kissing. Uh, they did not know this experience. Yeah. <laughs> it was, What? <laughs> and of course, there was a whole theory that it wasn't until the Italian uh, Renaissance that 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 kissing became a social custom, at least you know, kissing on the lips. So um, now that I don't know, I I don't know the answer to that debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, but 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 again, the, the power of storytelling, the idea that your subconscious is trying to express something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why do, why do writers write? You know, why do, and, and, and if you're a career writer, the answer probably is because you can't do anything else. Yeah, true. You like know, in that, I, or you can't not. With, um, you're going to want to express yourself in some way or other. And yeah. it would be true if, you know, if you played clarinet or, you know, trombone mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or you, you're a, an opera singer or whatever. I mean, if, if, if that is the means of expression, that you have found connects the most with your soul. Yeah. You, you can't help but do it. I mean, it'd be great if people paid you, but they, you know, they may yeah. not. Well, sometimes they may. Yeah. They so, may not. So how do, how can writers consciously use their subconscious mind when they write? Well, actually I've got a story about that too. <laughs> um, once upon a time, I, uh, I won an award for an unpublished or an un, unshot, unsold screenplay, uh, Mr. Ballpoint, which now is a book. I made it into a book, but it still is in the movie. But I won an award for it, and this was an independent feature project, which is now called Film Independent. And the, the prize was a mentoring class. So with, with a dozen other talented award winners, mm -hmm. I studied with Lee David Zlotoff for about six months. Now right. he is the guy who invented MacGyver. Yeah. And colorful character wore Hemingway style jackets, uh, uh, <laughs> stepped outside to chain smoke. Um, but, um, but one of the things Lee said was, uh, the story he told was, um, he says, I've never been able to stare at a blank page. He says, I can't write an outline. I can't get unstuck. He said, I just, and he says, the thing I found was before I had an office, uh, before I could afford an office, I would go to Santa Monica Public Library. Mm -hmm. And I would sit there and it was quiet. I'd try to concentrate. He said, but uh, even there in the quiet, uh, table to myself, pad in front of me, he said, couldn't write a word. He said, but what I would do is I would ask myself a question. He said, then I would walk. So I had, uh, if, if I walked aimlessly in the library, I'd get thrown out because they think I was a homeless person. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to look like I was, I had to say, okay, I'm going to go over to 19th century history. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would have a goal. But he said, I would go over there and I would take my time and I, I'd look around on the show. And I, and I, but, I, but again, I had this question in, my, in mind, but I wouldn't be obsessing about it. But he said, by the time I got around the library and got back to my seat and sat down, he said, I'd have something. I'd have, I'd have, I might. and he said, and, and it's, so people would say, well, you don't go to the library anymore. What do you do today? He says, I have an office to myself. I turn up the, my stereo and I dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. that's a secret. I don't, I, I presume he doesn't mind my <laughs> telling that story, but, but uh, you know, again, it's it's a matter of turning off mm -hmm. the censoring mind, and you yeah. know that that old expression. Why don't you just sleep on it? 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really good yeah. literal advice. If you are, if you are stumped or if you've, or the people who say, you know, it came to me in the shower. Well, why did it come to you? The reason it came to you in the shower is that the sound of the shower is white noise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is all the frequencies of, it's like white light. Okay. It's all yeah. the frequencies mixed together. And for whatever reason that somehow unlocks your brain, things are going to come to you when and you, you could buy a white noise machine and you could plug your headphones in. And, and, and I, I guarantee you, if you plug yourself into one of those, you, you're going to go, why am I thinking about that restaurant in Maryland? I, you know, it's been, it's been a dozen years since I've been there, you know, and m- maybe even then you're not going to know, well, why not set your scene there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. And one of the things that happened in Lee's class was um, we had Jodie Foster's uh, producer uh, mm-hmm. come in one day. And she said, I'm going to give you a writing assignment. Um, uh, you're going to write for two minutes. Your pen is not going to leave the paper. You're just going to write continually, whatever, whatever, whatever comes to mind, but you cannot stop. So write for two minutes, and the, here it is, is the two friends, one meets the other, one has a secret and will not, will, will not share it. Hmm. Okay? So and I guarantee you a scene's going to come out of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, so once you get into this space, and uh, that's funny because I was just, I recorded earlier um, a session uh, for the, International Dublin Writers um, Festival that's starting uh, September 11th, and I was talking about mindfulness tools for authors. So what you're th- what you're telling, what you're saying, like walking and kind of clearing and or getting out of your way, like the the conscious mind and connecting to the deeper self. I was talking about it earlier, so that's really interesting. Yes, yes, yes. And, and of course, meditation yeah. takes you yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And going back to Erickson, that mm-hmm. was actually one of his mantras, if you will, is, and again, it connected to, you know, they, they called him a hypnotist, but he claimed that um, there were all kinds of levels of trance um, and that any attention span you have, Anytime you are not in the room, anytime you're in your head, anytime mm-hmm. you are having a fantasy, anytime, anytime you're tripping, you're in a trance, you're in a trance state. Your, your, your subconscious, if you will, mm-hmm. if that's the term, is, is fully alert and taking in and, and listening and also able to express. So whatever is coming out, whatever is coming up for you at that time, uh, and, you know, in, in, in these preacher stories, you know, my main character is, uh, this is not Christian fiction, okay? This is not, this is not a moral lesson. The, my main character is a guy who dropped out of divinity school. He, he, he studied astrophysics. He dropped out of that. You know, he's, he, he, he doubts his own beliefs in faith. Uh, all the time, and yet he still works as a guest preacher mm-hmm. to make a couple of <laughs> bucks. But people, people come to him with problems because there's a rumor in this small town he can he can work miracles. Well, he can't work miracles, of course, but he do, he does because he's got one of these inquiring minds and an incessant curiosity, and he's also something of a data driller. Is he can get answers after the sheriff has closed the case. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I mean, you know, in the genre of book publishing, that's called an amateur sleuth. And, you know, that was um, uh, most of Agatha Christie's stories, was, you know, nice, nice blue haired lady, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, who just happens to be at the scene of a crime. It, it, you know, it's an old formula, but, um, uh, and, and you can get away with a lot because you don't really have to be an expert on mm-hmm. police procedure mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you're, your your investigator is not an expert. Your yeah. investigator is is just one half a step ahead of the reader in terms of uh, investigative skill, and um, you know that's a, that's a, an, another parallel that I like is Jean Le Carre, and his you know these are spy stories, but his the term that he uses for a spy is close observer. Mm-hmm. Now a close observer, when you think about it is exactly what a reader is. So I believe, and at least from my experience and my enjoyment of John Le Carre Carre novels is, 
in telling you spy stories, he teaches you how, as a reader, to be a close observer. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. teaches you how to pay attention to detail. He, and, and by doing so, he, he's able to engage you with stories of great cleverness and subtlety because on other readers that are maybe used to reading Pulp Fiction where, you know, the clues are dropped with a thud, <laughs> um, he, he can tell you some very sophisticated and, and, uh, um, and, and Byzantine stories. I mean, his plots are usually, often they're about false flag operations, mm-hmm. which of course he totally disapproves of. And I, I, I think many thinking people would, you know, is, is we think the enemy's doing this and it's actually our own side doing it to, to trick the enemy, but half the time they trick us or they trick themselves. So, you know, they're, they're very complicated plots, but yes, close observer, the close observer. And, and you pay attention to every detail. But I think, I think a good author a good writer has to be a close observer in everyday reality. You need to be really paying pay attention to everything that's around you. And then you take it in, it goes into your subconscious, and then at the right moment, it pops up. And, you, well, and, and you're, you're taking just, notes even mm-hmm. when you think you're not. I mean, yeah. yes, of course. I mean, Le Carre always talked about he's traveling in Southeast Asia, and, and he's in these war zones, and he's scribbling in his notebook. But uh, even if you haven't taken notes, uh, if, again... If you if you put yourself back in that restaurant in Maryland twelve years ago, mm-hmm. uh, and you start describing the situation, okay, you might be inventing some details, but it would be, but you, but they will be details that, oh, I can't remember, you know what, uh, what did, was was the bar marble or, yeah. or was it was it uh, was, was it varnished hardwood? Oh, maybe it was walnut. Oh, it had a real gloss on it. Okay, as you do that. You're, you're opening yourself up to all those details where, okay, the things that you fictionalize may be things that your subconscious is slipping in there. And you won't know why. And, 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 and as, an, as an author, I think you trust that, you know, somehow this is either going to be significant later or maybe I'll go back and I'll just, uh, if this was a sidetrack. I'll, I'll, I'll edit it out. Um, but I think also, uh, and this is something that uh, all authors do and fiction and nonfiction is, you know, you get to the end. It's, it's much more difficult to write the first chapters of a book than it is to write the latter chapter. Mm-hmm. The first third of a book almost always gets rewritten in, in many yeah. different ways. I agree. And one of the reasons is that when you get to the end, you realize that there are certain seeds you have to plant mm-hmm. in order mm-hmm. for those things to blossom so yeah. you do what I, I i used to call it backward integration yeah. is i've got to go and i've got to you know if if the main character is going to use a gun god forbid okay we've got to somehow show in an earlier scene mm-hmm. a that he has one and note and b that he knows how to use it. Okay, so we've got we've got to have some target practice we're going to see him load it we have to see him go on a hunting trip we have to we have to see something um you know, or out long with a speech of "I hope I'll never have to use it," or you know, yeah, something um, like that. Um, because um, there's just way too much, so, way too much violence everywhere these days. Uh, so, but, do you um, still do do still authors need to outline, although they use their subconscious mind? Uh, and you say, do they need to outline? Yeah, you know, like you know the that uh, controversy between or uh, the well, antagonist I, you know, between I think you can have cancer. a skeleton mm-hmm. I yeah. you know I mean I I I know kind of where I want to end up Yeah I think that's when, important uh, Preacher Preacher uh the third preacher book is going to be called I believe Preacher raises the dead mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to be about euthanasia Mm-hmm. So somebody is going to go into coma and there's going to be a controversy about whether they should be put on life mm-hmm. support. Mm-hmm. Okay. And of course there'll be religious questions and medical questions. And as a, as a preacher, he, he'll be called upon, he'll supposed, he, he'll be expected to have opinions and then near death experiences. 
you know, is there is there life after death, preacher? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we pull the plug, are is this the end for her, or or what are the consequences, or or should we should we let her experience sunlight on her face, you know, uh, even though that's the only thing that she can experience at this point, or is she experiencing that? So so here are these issues that are, are very much. Um, on the leading edge these days. And yet they're coming out simply because I've asked this question uh, of, okay, if, if I were thought to be um, a thought leader or a religious mm -hmm. leader in a, in a small town where there's everything from well-educated people to people who believe in the most, in the most incredible kind of superstition, uh, demonic possession, for example, um, or all the, you know, how about this latest uh, thing about, you know, um, politicians eating babies? Well, I got news for you. If you study your history, the Romans accused Christians of eating babies and the Christians accused Jews of eating babies in the first century. Okay. And so we have certain lies that, that, ha that gained traction no matter how many thousands of years have elapsed. Um, so, you know, that's as political as I'll get today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, uh, yeah, we are kind of getting close to the, to the end of this episode, so we kind of need to wrap it up. Um, but before doing that and uh, telling people, telling our viewers where they can find you online and where they can buy your books, what would be your top, let's say, three tricks that you can give, uh, you can give authors to help them access their subconscious more easily or use it in their writing? Well, as I say, ask yourself a question. Whether it's about the premise, what should, I, what should this be about? Or uh, uh, who, who's involved or where are they going or what kind of story? Ask yourself a question and sleep on it, take a walk, mm -hmm. uh, go walk, walk in the, the woods by the, by the beach, uh, just you know, take a nap, uh, find a way for your subconscious to open up. Uh, the second thing I would say is get out of your own way. Uh, don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes because the things that you think are mistakes may not be. <laughs> it's all about the editing, okay? Now, I don't believe that you should uh, write endlessly and and uh and then go back and just hack everything up i don't i don't believe that writing is editing or necessarily rewriting i think that it's possible for you to maintain a a, a fair amount especially when once you find out where it's going uh and that then that would be the third thing is once you've got characters established once they're on the page once they're talking to each other let them talk let them act because you will find the character is going to want to do things <laughs> that yeah. you and this I found out as an actor you know that there were there were at, there were aspects of my personality I had no idea I could be such a jerk mm -hmm. <laughs> me neither I don't believe you Gerald I don't believe you <laughs> uh, uh, I don't believe you I love it when you talk dirty <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much it's been um it's been such a such a joy and so informative as always to to get a chance to to talk to you and learn more about what makes your books um, such a great read and 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 um, what inspires you. So um, I would like to to you to tell our viewers where they can find you, where they can uh, get your books. And, uh, yes. Well, my my uh, my author blog, my my personal website for authors is um, GeraldEverettJones.com, and there you're going to find uh, my book list. You're going to find my latest rants and raves. Then, if you're interested in um, advice for your own writing career and uh, support, GetPublishedRadio.com has got all our episodes on it, and you can also subscribe through iTunes and wherever else. There, it, all our episodes are there, and there's there's three years of episodes there. Yeah. So, yeah, those two places, GeraldEverettJones.com, if you, if you want to read, and um, uh, Get Published Radio, if you'd like to hear me spout. 
<laughs> yeah, that that's uh, I mean that would be I I uh, I highly recommend. Uh, and you were on our show. You were you were a great yeah. guest. We we <laughs> talked about um, uh, relationships and uh, and your books and and uh, and your generosity of spirit, which really comes through the it was even, it was the microphone back then. But, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Gerald. I I appreciate your kindness and your words and your support.